and welcome to Legal Cut Pro, the Canadian Entertainment Law Podcast. My name is Gregory Pang, and I'm here with Michelle Molyneux. Hey, M- Michelle, how you doing? Good, thanks. How about yourself, Craig? Excellent, excellent. Today's podcast is, I guess, uh, part four now, right, Michelle, of our music licensing series? Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, before we get right into it, Michelle, can you give us a shout out to our sponsor, please? Uh, Definitely. This podcast is brought to you by Ampia and its professional development team. Special thanks to Jane Too Good, our audio editor. You can find her on Instagram at JJ underscore Too Good. Thanks, Michelle. Anything new to talk about on your end? Uh, I guess nothing, nothing too crazy, but I signed up for what looks like a really cool talk this week. Uh, it's Wednesday night, so I guess when people listen to this, it'll already have happened. But it's through Vancouver Film School, and it's their Storyteller Studio. So the topic that I'm going to go watch is The New Actor's Mindset with Matthew Lillard and uh, Joe Town. And so it's kind of about uh, taking an athlete's performer's mindset, but kind of infusing that into an actor. Oh, did you have any idea what that would mean? I, I'm assuming it's probably a lot of visualization and self-talk and that kind of stuff. Okay, that sounds really, really cool. Well, uh, no, yeah. totally have fun with that. That sounds excellent. Well, on my end, I have a couple of core applications coming up. Um, I don't want to get into those, the details of those right now. And as well, I am going to be teaching my real estate law course again at uh, McEwen University this September. And I have some really interesting, at least I think interesting content to include. And uh, this is flowing from the CBC's uh, Slumtown podcast, basically about how ineffective our laws are to deal with um, certain problem properties. So anyway, nothing to do with entertainment law. (laughs) I thought I'd just mention that. And me and my wife are almost done watching Stranger Things 3. Yeah. Do you watch Stranger Things at all, Michelle? I haven't. So I'm curious to know which season do you like the best? Like, should I start with one or just like jump into three? No, no, you definitely got to start with one. Okay. Um, That's just... It's kind of like the, not kind of like, it, it is the beginning of the adventure. And as you watch see Stranger Things through the seasons, because these kids, they start out when, when they're, I don't know, maybe 10 years old or uh, uh, thereabouts. And you watch them through season two, season three, how they're growing up. And they adapt the story as they grow up from these little kids to now essentially, teen, well, not essentially, they are teenagers. And so it's, uh, it's a great show. Definitely recommend it. That's awesome. Okay, so I'll check it out and I'll start with season one. <laughs> so today we're going to talk briefly about cue sheets. And then we have a little bit of an interesting case. It's a federal court case out of Ontario that deals with uh, music rights as they are used in music video. So cue sheets, let's start with our cue sheets. Yeah. Yeah, we've been talking about different music rights in the past few episodes, mainly about sync rights and master use rights in relation to using a piece of music in your film production. So there is uh, lots of other types of music rights, but one in particular are performing rights. And performing rights are basically the right to perform a work in public. An example of public performance that everyone might be familiar with is hearing a song on the radio. So in general, when a song is played on the radio, the composer and the publisher will be financially compensated for the performing rights. And that's what people commonly know as royalties. And similarly, when a television show and movie airs or is shown in a a public uh, movie theater, the music that is part of the production is a public performance in that kind of context and the composer and publisher are owed royalties for that performance but don't panic the royalties of these public performance rights don't come directly or are not paid directly from the producer rather performance rights societies will collect those fees from tv broadcasters movie theaters etc and then those performance rights societies will distribute those royalties to the rights holders of those performing rights So an example of a performing rights society in Canada is SOCAN, otherwise known as the Society of Composers, Authors, and Music Publishers of Canada. Some other performing rights societies include PRS in the UK and ASCAP in the US. Basically, then SOCAN is a collective society responsible for administering performing rights. It receives programming information on an ongoing basis, which tells us what 
audiovisual productions are being shown on TV and in movie theaters. So in general, the problem is that programming information only allows SOCAN to log the number of performances for each show or movie. That programming information doesn't provide any detail about what music is actually being used in each production. And that's where cue sheets come in. So cue sheets generally are a written record of music in a production, an audiovisual production. They're the primary means by which performing rights societies track the use of music in film and TV, and then collect and distribute those royalties to holders of those performance rights. Exactly. So accuracy is super important with cue sheets. If your cue sheets aren't filled out correctly, and if they aren't submitted to SOCAN, the composers and publishers who hold the rights to the music in your production, they will probably be kind of cranky because they're not going to be getting paid what they're owed. What the heck is uh, or goes on a cue sheet then, Michelle? Okay, so we're going to post a link in the show notes for everybody. SOCAN has a cue sheet template and quite a bit of information about cue sheets as well. So hopefully that will be helpful for our listeners. So the information that usually goes on a cue sheet includes things such as your production title, release date, country of origin, would be Canada. And then for each song, you're going to need to know details about the composer, publisher, song title, and whether the music is theme, feature, or background. And just in case you're not familiar with it, the difference between theme music, feature music, or background music is... So theme music is when the music is used in the opening or closing sections of some kind of a production. Uh, So that's going to be commonly, yeah, your opening music or uh, what plays during the credit scroll. Background music is when the music is used to create ambience for the viewer. And with background music, the characters are not aware of the music playing, which kind of makes me think of in real life, I kind of wish we had dramatic music playing in moments. It'd be kind of fun. (laughs) (laughs) Especially if something scary is about to happen. You're like, I hear the scary music. What's going to happen? Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And then feature music is when the characters are aware that music is playing. So that would be, say, for example, the characters are in a bar and there's maybe a band playing or they're dancing and listening to music. So in our example from part one of our music licensing, uh, when the, uh, the perpetrators in Brooklyn Nine-Nine were singing the lines to I Want It That Way by the Backstreet Boys, that would be essentially feature music? Yes, definitely. Okay, perfect. So any tips then for creating a cue sheet or filling out a cue sheet? Uh, Yeah, yeah, I've got a couple tips. Uh, One handy tip is keep track of information as you're selecting music for your project. So you're going to need to know song title, composer, publisher, the split between the composer and publisher. Uh, You may also want to know if your composer or publisher have a SOCAN number, or I guess rather that would just be whether your composer has a SOCAN number. And you want to keep track of this information as you go along because it can be a pain to go back and piece together this information and track it all down afterwards. And it can be especially a pain if you're using stock music clips. So you want to know you can get the information you need as you're going along so that you're not going to have gaps on your cue sheet when you go to submit it later. Hmm, Perfect. It looks like a lot lot of information to keep in mind. Oh, wait, I have more tips. Okay. (laughs) But that's not all. (laughs) Once you've finished your cue sheet, you're going to need to make sure a producer signs it. And in Canada, you're going to want to submit it to cue sheets submit at SOCAN.com. And one last handy tip. If the cue sheet has composers that are a part of different performing rights societies, say, for example, you have a composer who is a SOCAN member and another who is an ASCAP member in the U.S., you only need to submit one cue sheet and you can submit that cue sheet to SOCAN so you don't have to go around and submit to all the other performing rights societies. Well, that's great because otherwise that'd be kind of a bit burdensome, hey, to have to submit it to performing rights societies and jurisdictions all over the world, right? So Definitely, yeah. yeah. So that simplifies things for sure. Are we done with cue sheets then? I thought I had something else to say and just kind of popped up, but now it also popped out of my head. (laughs) Excellent. Well, I think we've given people a lot to digest about cue sheets if you're not familiar with it already, or if you only have a passing familiarity with cue sheets. So hopefully that's helpful for everyone. 
All right, let's move on then. So we have a case called Young and Thacker. Uh, the citation, if uh, anyone's actually interested in looking up, is uh, 2019 FC 835. It is a very recent decision of the Federal Court of Canada, and we'll be posting the link to this decision in our show notes. This is an interesting case. I wanted to discuss this because it's a recent case and it concerns music. Uh, it's not the best kind of decision for uh, in terms of, you know, presidential case law because it's an unopposed application or essentially an unopposed application. The uh, defending or the responding party didn't appear uh, in court. They filed an affidavit, uh, but I, I believe that's looks like that's about it. So it's akin to a default judgment almost. So, but they still, they, meaning the applicant still had to prove their case before the judge, even though the other person didn't defend it. So what this case is interesting, and we won't go into the nitty gritty of it, is that there's a really good summary of the case law within this decision on statutory damages in uh, the Copyright Act. So a lot better than I explained it at uh, in our uh, episode where with my BAMP Story Studio recording there, a lot way better than I explained it there. So uh, in terms of a summary of what actually happened in this case, though, it involved an oral agreement to create a music video where an artist named Melody Young responded to a Kijiji ad by Rohit Thacker operating as Bad Mash Factory, advertising his services for creating music videos. And so Young wanted to hire him, or she did hire him, to create a music video for her song Secrets for which she owned the, the rights to. Well, she owned, personally owned the composition rights and her company owned the uh, sound recording. So in the end, they disagreed. The decision states that they disagreed on whether the music video was completed to Young's satisfaction, but Thacker decided to post the music video on his website and on Vimeo. What happened then? There was a cease and desist letter that was sent. Take this down. He didn't. So Melody Young sued for copyright infringements with respect to the composition of the song and the recording contained in the music video. And here I, I'll quote from the decision. It states that, uh, quote, Mr. Thacker asserts that he thought he had permission to use or at least had not been prohibited from using the sound recording with the music video in his portfolio. And here's the first lesson in this case is like, you don't assume you have permission to use. Never the, assume. <laughs> yeah, use the un, uh, an underlying copyright work in the work that you worked in for your portfolio. You need a, a license or some kind of permission uh, to be able to do that. So Young sued again and asked for $1.64 million in statutory damages and other damages for significant financial losses. Actually, I'm not sure if that was uh, both together, but in any case, $1.64 million in damages, but they brought no evidence as to actual financial losses. In the end, and here's the thing, remember, $1.64 million in damages requested as their remedy. They got their injunction, essentially saying, you, you can't do this anymore. He took it down already anyway. And they got a, an award, a damages award, statutory damage of $2,000 and costs of $2,500. So they went in asking for $1.64 million, walked out, inclusive of costs, $4,500. Slight difference. <laughs> Just a slight difference. <laughs> so again, lesson one here is don't assume you have permission to reproduce or use a work for your portfolio, and especially in the context of there's underlying copyright that is not yours, that whatever that uh, the project that you worked on. Mm -hmm. In this case, the underlying work was the song. This person's, him and his company created the music video, the, the visuals, but there's this underlying work to the music video and did not have permission to do that or a license to do that. Mm -hmm. And number two is that if you sue someone for copyright infringement, you should probably learn how statutory damages work in Canada is that it's on a per work basis for all instances of infringement. What they tried to do is calculate, they went for the maximum statutory damages per work, which was $20,000, and they multiplied it by the number of downloads, views, whatever, to come to their $1.64 million. Well, here, the judge said, no, that's not how you do it. We're going to look at all this case law, and then we're going to come to a reasonable level of statutory damages being just $2,000. That's $1,000 per work infringe, one for the composition and one for the recording. So, so not much in terms of overall, like especially compared to what they were asking. We're looking at a very, very tiny fraction of what they were asking. 
Mm-hmm. And lastly, if you're going to plead actual damages, then you have to bring actual evidence of those damages. We don't, we don't have the, the benefit of accessing anything uh, other about this decision other than uh, the, the, the written decision itself. But for some reason or, or the other, they did not bring evidence of actual damages. So the judge essentially say, no, you don't get any actual damages. You're just getting statutory damages. That's $1,000 per and plus $2,500 in costs. So for a case or uh, a court action that I don't know what it would have cost this Mel D. Young, maybe $10,000, $20,000 to bring this application and have <laughs> their lawyer appear in court. They walked away with $4,500. So I guess that's lesson four is that, damn, litigation is expensive. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Even in a setting like this where it's unopposed, uh, the person uh, does not send, maybe didn't even use a lawyer, uh, the, the respondent, and never he didn't even bother showing up in court. You're never guaranteed what you're asked for. You still have to prove your case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing that I found kind of interesting about the case is uh, Miss Young was seeking to get her raw footage as well as part of the judgment. And I don't know, maybe she was thinking, I guess if she could get the raw footage, someone else could edit it for her so that they wouldn't be at a loss for that as well. And uh, so I just found it really interesting because the judge, although he did grant her the, the 2000 for the copyright infringement, said that she didn't have a right to the raw footage. Yeah, I think the judge was correct. Uh, did not The judge did not elaborate too much on it. But uh, if you go back to, I think, copyright first principles is that this uh, Thacker person created the visuals, the raw footage, and the default position is that the first author, the, the creator, is the first author and the copyright owner. And um, I think it was actually, uh, I'm going to take a step back and say that there was nothing that was pled, at least it seems like from the decision that was pled, that gave any merit to their the applicant's entitlement to the raw footage. Everything that they pled and all the evidence that they led was with respect to the infringed works, not mm-hmm. with respect to the raw footage. So that's my guess at why the, the judge was like, just, just dismiss that. Like, look, no, you're not entitled. You haven't pled anything, uh, pled anything that says that you're entitled to this footage. Uh, I'm not going to uh, allow a remedy for which you didn't uh, raise any, um, any argument about your entitlement to um, this, mm-hmm. uh, this property. Mm-hmm. Perhaps that might be another take home message is um, when, because um, a lot of the producers listening, they might be involved in music videos as well, is to really lay out when you're entering a project with, say, an artist, if you're doing a music video, really lay out who does own that footage at the end of the day and, and that kind of thing. And if people are unhappy with edits, what are the options? Absolutely. And, yeah. And do you have a right to include your work as part of a por- portfolio or a demo at the end of the day. Absolutely. And I, I've had clients in the video production services before, and they've, we've had it both ways. And in some instances, depending how much the client pays, maybe if it's not so much, maybe we own the raw footage and we're the only thing that you're entitled to and that you're owning is the, the finished product. Mm-hmm. And when it's done, we'll assign to you that all rights in that finished product and then it's yours right Mm -hmm. but if the prices or the fees are much higher then our agreement is that well okay we're going to assign to you everything you own all the raw footage and uh, we take a license back as the video production company to the finished product as part of our portfolio just to show as part of our portfolio so i've seen that kind of those kind of arrangements before in contracts but Mm -hmm. very good point absolutely Okay, so let's, uh, anything else about this case? Uh, no, I don't think I have any other stuff yourself. Nope, I think that's good. Uh, again, we will post the citation and the link to the case in the show notes if anyone is uh, interested to read. And there, again, it is a really good summary of the case law within the decision of statutory damages and entitlement to statutory damages and how the v- various factors go into a judge's decision on how what the level of those statutory damages are and again actually before we uh, sign off on this uh, case here or move uh, move on from this case statutory damages are damages that are prescribed by legislation here the copyright act where you don't have to prove the damages but you still have to need evidence as to your entitlement to the level of those statutory damages because for commercial infringement it's up to twenty thousand dollars per work for all instances of infringement so you have to still make an argument you can't just say twenty thousand and leave no evidence 
um, mm -hmm. or leave very little evidence as to entitlement. So it uh, depends on a whole variety of factors. But I think that's it. So should we move on to feedback? Sure. Yeah. Our first piece of feedback is from Dean Bush, and this is from a while ago, and it's with respect to our very first substantive episode when we talked about the copyright lawsuit against the supermodel Gigi Hadid. A real quick summary is that Gigi Hadid had posted a picture on her Instagram account, a picture that was taken by essentially a paparazzi of her uh, in, in public somewhere, right? I think that's how it went. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and so Gigi Hadid got sued for posting a picture of herself is what happened in the end. I haven't kept up with the uh, the happenings of the case. I don't think it's uh, proceed uh, actually moved on any further. At least um, I haven't seen any, uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't researched it. But the question from Dean Bush is that how does fair use fall into all of this? You know, in terms of, well, is there a fair use defense by Gigi Hadid for posting this picture of herself on her Instagram account? Well, in terms of fair use, I, can, uh, I think we can speak to fair dealing in Canada, which is uh, under Section 29 of our Copyright Act, is our equivalent of fair use. What you have to do is you raise it as, in this kind of scenario, as a defense. You know, like generally the test for fair dealing is you have to look at the purpose of the dealing, the character of the dealing, the amount of the de dealing, the alternatives to the dealing, the nature of the work, and the effect of the dealing itself. You can't just say, oh, this is fair dealing or fair use, full stop. Fall, it has to fall under one of the enumerated grounds of fair dealing, you know, research, private study, parody, satire, criticism, comment, uh, or the one newer provision is non-commercial generated or user generated content. And in the end, looking at this without going into a deep dive of the test for fair dealing, I just don't know if Gigi Hadid has any kind of fair use or fair dealing defense. You know, like she was posted this, she could, she monetizes her Instagram account, right? And and it was it's like something like uh, she can get a lot of money uh, from uh, from monetizing her Instagram account. I, me I remember we talked about some pretty pretty big dollars, right? Yeah, yeah. If she's um, yeah advertising a product. Definitely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure if any uh, if, if fair dealing or fair use applies, but uh, it, it'd be interesting if she has filed a defense and if this is raised that this is fair use for some kind of reason. Um, yeah. Uh, but in the end, you have to establish that, that you have merit to that defense of fair dealing. It's not just, oh, it's, it's just a picture, so it's fair use. No, 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 no. You have to meet the test to be able to rely on fair dealing as a defense to copyright infringement. There's an update, Greg. There is. <laughs> About the Hadid case, yeah. All right, what is it? She says she can post paparazzi photos because she smiled in them. <laughs> she wants to rewrite copyright law. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, hey, um, you know, if you have that kind of money, uh, maybe you have, uh, you know, all sorts of lawyers and influence with lobbyists and legis, you know, legislative peoples and to to rewrite the copyright law uh, and and that's something you know what and that's actually a live issue I know we've t touched on policy before but maybe there's an argument here saying that this is this is BS you know why can't she post a picture of herself you know we've already went into the merits of that in, in uh, our, our episode but yeah okay well good luck to her I I, uh, <laughs> I, I um, look forward to seeing how that goes yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. So I guess she's saying that she contributed to many elements of the copyright in the photo. Oh. Um, so she contributed to the photo in the form of her smile and her outfit. Interesting. So she's contributing some kind of authorship to it, some kind of joint authorship then it seems like, right? Mm-hmm. That's oh. interesting. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> totally off tangent. I was like, what no. is No, no, that's... <laughs> Excellent. Oh, no, I'm glad you found that because I, I'm wondering if that's part of her defense. Uh, again, I, have, I haven't looked at the defense, but if she even filed one or if she's just, just, these are just public comments. Are these uh, public comments or is this uh, part taken from her defense? This seems like it's some kind of, um, it's this, her memorandum of support. Oh, okay. So is it, it, it is a... Yeah, it seems like these yeah, are some of her, I guess it would be her legal pleadings at this time. Okay. Response. Huh. 
Well, one day we will have an update on this, maybe when it uh, progresses a little bit further. Yeah, yeah, I'll keep an eye on it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so contrib- So one of the parts of her defense is not, at least from that, that the, uh, you saw there was not fair use, or maybe it is somewhere later in the document, but one of it is contributing to the authorship of the photo. Mm-hmm. Another piece of feedback we received is from David Maroth, and this is following one of our music licenses, music licensing, sorry, episodes. And the first question is regarding... Who is responsible for obtaining the required music licenses? Would that be the director of the film or the production itself? Ah, very good question, David. Or Dave. He signs off as Dave here. Uh, So Dave, who is responsible is whoever the production company, I guess, delegates the responsibility to. I know that sounds circular, but... If it's a very small production, it may be the producer, her or himself, who would be making the phone calls or sending the emails and requesting the sync and master use licenses. Or they could have someone assigned to that. So responsibility, again, whoever it delegates it to, or you can hire someone like our interview subject, Elizabeth Klink, as a music music supervisor, who has the relationships with a lot of these publishers and rights holders and publication companies to be able to more smoothly... Um, and maybe with more effectiveness and uh, timeliness, get these licenses from these various rights holders. Now, if your question though, Dave, is who is liable, ultimately the liability is the uh, falls to the, the corporation, the production company uh, themselves, right? So, um, so yeah, so that answers that question. And David had another question. Oh, yes. Okay, this one he's asking... If you're trying to license a musical work and if, let's say, the more popular version of that song, let's go with Backstreet Boys, I Want It That Way, the album or the the radio release version is too expensive, then can we try to license an earlier, perhaps a demo version of that song? You can try. I think there's uh, no harm in trying, but whether you'll be successful is another issue. Actually, this would have been a really good question for Elizabeth Klink during your interview, oh, right? Darn. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't deal with these directly, you know, in terms of asking for, for the licenses, but uh, this is, these are all freely negotiable. So uh, from, the, from that standpoint, it's if they're willing to license it to you, maybe the rights holders like, nah, we don't want you to use that one. That's not a very polished version. That's an earlier version. We don't want to license that to you. You're going to license the radio release. Are you going to license this uh, remastered release uh, 10 years later or something like that? That's the version we want you to use and we will not license the other one. So you can, in the end, you can try, but whether you are successful in being able to um, license that earlier version for a lower rate that uh, because of the, uh, the the more popular version is too expensive. That's another question. And um, yeah, so that's all I have to say about that. Awesome. I think, is that all our feedback for right now? So keep it coming, people. We yeah, really yeah, we like to hear it. And um, if you are sending us feedback, feel free to uh, include your Instagram handle as well so we can follow you back on Instagram. Yes, please. So where can people find us then, Michelle? Okay, so uh, you can reach us through email, either greg at legalcutpro.com or michelle at legalcutpro.com. And Greg, you're on Twitter? Yep, at Cyclaw, C-Y-C-L-E-W, the original cycling lawyer. And I am on Instagram at Michelle Molyneux. And you can find our podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and I think a a few other uh, platforms as well. I think we're probably done with music licensing for now. Are we, Greg? I think for now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We may have more to do with it later, but uh, this is the last in our mini series, four part mini series of music licensing. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening to our music licensing series and for listening to this podcast. If you like our podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes. Leave us that five star review. We'd be uh, very happy to see it. If you don't like our podcast, um, maybe don't leave us a review. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. reviews, please. <laughs> <laughs> if it, uh, no, do what you want. Uh, but uh, yeah, we really would appreciate uh, more reviews on iTunes. It uh, would help uh, people find us and uh, raise our, I, I guess, relevance on whatever algorithm it's used uh, on, on iTunes because that's one of the most popular platforms for podcasts out there. So anyway, so again, 
please leave us a review on iTunes. Awesome. Well, thanks for listening. Thank you. See you next time or talk to you next time. <laughs>